Uh, today I want to talk to you about how to pray effectively. Um, most, of, most of our prayers that we pray are prayers that uh, I call them mechanized prayers or they're prayers that we come up with because we have to pray. And most of the times uh, we wake up in the morning and we feel like we have to pray. And so we force ourselves through this motions of saying a bunch of words or mumbling words from our mouths but most of the times they're just words that we are trying to come up with because you're tired you, you know you have a lot of things in your mind and you want to keep going and uh, our prayers don't become effective prayers there's prayers that god will accept who i call effective prayers or prayers that god accept prayers that are god breathed or prayers that the holy spirit has breathed upon prayers that are directed by god or controlled by god prayers that god initiates and it's not flesh it's not your work it's something that god just you know kind of probs you or prompts you to begin to pray and as you're praying the spirit of god enables you to pray effectively there's some secrets to praying those kind of effective prayers that i want us to learn and i believe the reason the reason why we've been talking so much about spirit soul and body is tied up to when that revelation finally hits you you understand how it affects everything in your life and in your walk with god so today i want to talk about the golden sensor and the acceptable incense the golden censer and the acceptable incense now how many of you know the altar of the incense and what it is the altar of incense in the tabernacle was the last altar right before you encounter the veil so it's the last altar before the veil before you go into the holies of holies so i want to talk about the altar of incense but I also want to talk about the golden censer because these are two different things. Uh, the golden censer was something that the priest had to have. When the priest got into office, they had to receive a golden censer, which was for them to... And, you know, there's a lot of people still burning, censor, you know, burning um, uh, incense today using censers. There's a lot of people who are still burning incense without knowing the meanings of these things. So I felt like, you know, God will give us a message today that ties up to this object so that we can understand how effective prayers are brought forth. So these are two different things. The altar of incense and the golden censer are two completely different things. Uh, keep your eyes on the picture on the screen. That's basically an altar of incense right there. And what you're seeing is the priest basically using a golden censer um, on the altar of incense. There's a connection between the two objects, a very important connection that will reveal to us how God wants us to, to pray. All right, so these are two completely different things. You can see another picture here of uh, the altar of incense. And then I want us to also read about the golden censer because, uh, you know, if you, if you went to the Catholic Church, they still ban this thing. In some Orthodox churches, they still burn the incense and i can tell you that now if you're burning it you're only attracting demons um it has nothing to do with prayers anymore jesus fulfilled the altar of incense he fulfilled the altar of um he became the golden censer uh, the acceptable sacrifice let us read leviticus 16 leviticus 16 and we're going to read from verses uh 12 to 13. I'm reading from verses 12. He says, And he shall take the censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he says, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he dies not. So we can see that this golden censer was to receive the fire from the altar of the Lord with hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the vial. And he put, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat, and that is upon the testimony 
that he will not die not because if he if he looked directly to the glory of God upon the mercy seat God will kill him so the cloud was to kind of cover the glory so that he doesn't uh, get to see it now we can also see another picture here an artist depiction of what uh, a golden censer is so the altar of, of incense talks about this acceptable sacrifice of Jesus Jesus became what the acceptable sacrifice of God that pleased him by him allowing himself to lay himself down for him willingly choosing to lay himself down as an acceptable sacrifice as a fragrant life for God and through him we are also being made into vessels that are acceptable we are being conformed to the image of Christ so Jesus satisfied God his sacrifice was satisfactory it ended the slaughtering of bulls it ended the slaughtering of goats and cows it ended all those earthly sacrifices and it, 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 it introduced Jesus the perfect intercessor or oh, our perfect sacrifice and God wants us to also be conformed into his image so that we are also perfect sacrifices that are pleasing to God because it's only from that place that when we pray prayers those prayers become acceptable now in Hebrews chapter 7 verses 25 he says he is able to save forever those who are drawing near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them he is able to save forever those who are being drawn near to God through him because he's always living to make intercession for us so we can see Jesus fulfilling that prophecy of being our intercessor by becoming an acceptable um, offering or an acceptable sacrifice therefore qualifying to be an intercessor for us Jesus is able to go between us and he can speak to God on our behalf we can draw near to God through him according to Hebrews chapter 7 25 the prophecy about Christ stated that he himself did what bore our sin of many and interceded for our transgressions in Isaiah 53 verses 12 he says that he himself bore our sin of many bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors we see that role of an intercessor being tied to Jesus over and over again only Jesus and the Holy Spirit are qualified to be our intercessors let us look at Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 and we're going to be reading from verses 26 and also verses 34 verses 26 verses 26 says likewise the spirit also helps us with our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought to but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered so we see Jesus is an intercessor the Holy Spirit is an intercessor it intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered also verses 34 says who is he that condemned Christ that died yeah rather that is risen again who is it that is in the right hand of God who maketh intercession for us so we see over and over only Christ and the Holy Spirit are tied to our intercession it says for we do not know how to pray so the Spirit helps us with groanings that cannot be uttered how many of you have ever woken up in the morning and you do not know how to pray and then the Spirit of God prayed through you or you spoke through tongues and in praying through tongues actually the Holy Spirit is praying for you so you know when when we do not know how to pray the Holy Spirit steps in and takes a hold of us and is able to pray through us because we do not know how we should pray and sometimes we struggle to pray that's why God gave us the language tell somebody praying in tongues Paul said he prayed in tongues more than anyone <laughs> he, he was encouraging the church and saying pray in tongues I pray in tongues more than all of you okay so praying in tongues sometimes is beneficial because you do not know what to pray for 
or how to pray for it. But the Holy Spirit knows your heart and he knows the things that you do not want to pray about or the things that you're afraid of praying about because not everything we pray for is important before the Lord. There's priorities. But the Holy Spirit knows the priorities and you don't know it. So allowing him to pray for you is more effective because he can take your prayers and he can pray for you. He says it intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. They're called wordless groans. Tell somebody wordless groans. You don't have the words for it. And there's tears. And you feel like it's, it, it comes in waves and waves and waves. And you do not know how to stop. And it's no longer tongues. And it's the spirit taking your prayers in wordless groanings to the Lord. All right? How many of you have experienced that? It's a, it's a deeper level of prayer, okay? When you get to that place, you'll understand because you can't even speak in tongues. It's basically your mouth is being taken over by the Holy Spirit and your body is a part of it. You feel like you are birthing something. It's like it's, you, you feel like you're birthing something out of your body. It feels like it's a pang deep within you. It pushes and your voice cannot say anything. The Spirit is just praying through a language you cannot understand. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to my Father except through me. John chapter 14, verses 6. So, again, we see him again. It's the altar of incense. It is the veil, okay? It is the veil because Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20 tells us that we can enter through the blood of Jesus and through the veil, which was his flesh. So, it is the veil. It is the altar of incense. We are greatly blessed in having a great high priest. He says, a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. And John describes him as our advocate with the Father. In First John chapter 2, from verses 1 to 2. So Jesus can present our cases to God. It was acceptable to God because it was pure. It was holy. It was righteous. And without sin. And without spot or wrinkle. It was blameless tell somebody blameless okay so now let's let's look up once we have established that jesus is the perfect sacrifice who can pray for us effectively then we understand that he's calling us to be conformed into his nature because once you're conformed to his nature you can pray like him tell tell somebody i can pray like jesus the disciples didn't ask him lord teaches how to cast demons out they didn't ask him, Lord, teach us how to heal the sick. A sense, what did they ask him? He says, teach us how to pray. Why? Because they saw that everything that Jesus did was tied up to his prayer life. He prayed throughout the night. He stayed up late in the night. While everybody was sleeping, Jesus was praying the whole night. When they woke up in the morning, he was ready for ministry. He sometimes probably got less hours of sleep. But he was praying the whole time and every time he stopped preaching he went straight into prayer and that saturated prayer lifestyle that surrounded him that's what led to the power that flowed out of him and he says in leviticus chapter 16 from verses 12 to 13 you shall take a censer now a censer here is a picture of a holy vessel okay a golden it was a golden vessel that was used for putting incense so a sensor here is a picture of a golden vessel that has been tried and tested through fiery furnaces of life consecrated or dedicated to god that's what a golden sensor is a picture of it's a picture of a vessel that has been tried tested through the fiery furnaces of life consecrated and dedicated to God all right then Leviticus 16 from verses 12 to 13 says full of burning coals now this burning coals are fires from the Lord or the fire from the altar of the Lord so if you're a golden vessel you cannot put any other fire inside of you other than the fire of the Lord tell somebody the only light that needs to burn in you is the light of God the only fire that needs to be burning in your temple which is your body is the fire of god or the light of god or 
you go through the baptism of fire the purification of the lord through death to self then god introduces a fire in you so basically he's saying i'm looking for a vessel that is golden tell somebody golden vessel as we say it here golden containers god is looking for golden containers but how do you make a golden container the wilderness experiences how do you make someone into a vessel that is completely yielded and surrendered to God? You make them that by allowing them to go through the trials that God wants them to go through so that they can learn how to be yielded and how to be conformed to the image of God. You make someone a golden vessel when they allow, you know, you allow yourself to to go through the fires of life that God sends your way. Not everybody goes through the same fires but God will send you your own fires to do what? To conform you or to forge you into a weapon that is ready for battle. Okay? You got to be a weapon that is ready for battle because you don't know when the battle will come. The battle can show up any moment. Are you battle ready? <laughs> Are you battle ready? Are you ready to fight? You know? Are you fashioned in the flame of God and you're ready to face the enemy do you have your battle axe ready to chop the enemy to pieces do you have your weapons ready you have your armory set you can't get into that place unless you go through those fiery trials that will conform you into the image of God through what we call death to self or the purification process or the sanctification process so this fire is from the altar of death remember that when we talked about the steps to glory that every time that god wanted a fire in the tabernacle it had to be retrieved from the altar of death outside in the outer court why because that altar of death is a picture of what jesus did on the cross you can't do anything for god if you do not lean or if you do not lean on the foundation of his death on the cross also you cannot do anything for god unless you go through this death process jesus said if you don't drink my blood and you don't eat my flesh then you are you have nothing in common with me why did he say that he was saying that we have to partake of his life that is within the blood and we have to do what we have to partake of his flesh which is to allow ourselves to be conformed into his image through suffering now somebody will listen to this and say so why do we have to suffer well jesus suffered he was rejected he was beat he was backstabbed he was called the devil people called him names people insulted him people wanted to stone him people didn't like him people are not happy with him why do you think people should do that to you are you better than jesus I hear people, I just want to be happy. Scripture says, happy are you when you're persecuted. <laughs> I just want to be happy. The Christian life has no happiness in it. The happiness we have is in Christ. Tell somebody, the happiness is in Jesus. When you decide to become a Christian, you're entering warfare. The fires from the altar of death. God is always putting us in a place to die tell somebody god's always putting us in death places god is always putting us in wilderness places god is always taking us to gethsemane god is always allowing us to go through some pressing or some crushing to break something in you god is always wanting to get rid of something in your older nature that is not lining up with his will so every time we want a fire we have to go to that altar of death unless the lord puts his fire in you through death to self, you cannot be a golden vessel. And you will not offer the perfect sacrifice. And this is the altar of death. After you gave yourself, after you gave your life to Jesus, you decided to come and lay yourself on this altar as a living sacrifice. You laid on the altar willingly. Tell somebody willingly. Nobody forced you. You went to that altar and you laid there willingly and you allowed God's fire, okay, to burn through your issues. You allowed God's fire to purge your dross. You allowed God's fire to refine your dross. You allowed God's fire to purify you as gold. And as that fire purifies you, you become more golden. Or you become more conformed to the image of Christ. The trials of life have one assignment. 
is one assignment that the trials of life bring they bring us to a place of making choices and every choice we make has consequences we make choices that line up with God there's blessings we make choices that do not line up with God consequences we suffer many years of misfortunes stumbling until we come back to the light and understand the revelation of God's word and go back to his way let's look at Leviticus 16 from verses 12 to 13 and his hands full of sweet incense his hands full of sweet incense beaten small bring it within the vials now listen to what he says hands here when he's talking about hands he's talking about your service to God so when he says and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small bring it within the vial God is saying your hands means service clean hands and a pure heart tell somebody clean hands and a pure heart the Lord is demanding holy pleasing acceptable sacrifice so the hands are talking of your service to God clean hands and a pure heart they go together tell somebody give us clean hands give a pure, give us pure hearts the Lord is demanding a, a, a holy pleasing acceptable sacrifice so your prayers must be sweet before him and this type of sacrifice and service can only be found within what within the veil okay and the veil is the body of christ broken that we may enter in broken with him we, we enter in to be broken with him since he has been the bread from heaven that was broken for us we enter in so that we can be broken with him and becoming one with him in his sufferings of the flesh dying to self and the fleshly agendas that we have on life that allows us to conform to him in leviticus 16 from verses 12 to 13 it says and he shall put incense upon the fire before the lord and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he should not die this is like god taking prayers because we have identified incense as prayer god taking prayer and putting it inside of a golden vessel that has the fire of the Lord burning in him so that vessel will pray right for prayers this is what burdens of God is the God gives you burdens in prayer how many of you have ever experienced a burden of prayer for the Lord that other people may not have that same burden as you have it but when you begin to pray you find yourself so much praying about one issue more than other issues because you have a burden for that issue so what God will do is it will take the fire and the fire came from the altar of the Lord the fire will be in a tested vessel that has come forth as gold so when God put incense in that vessel it was an acceptable aroma the smoke that rose from that vessel and went up to God was an acceptable incense it pleased the Lord and the glory of God will come in response to this cloud the glory of God will come down in response to this sweet fragrance that was rising to God but to get to a place where it's a sweet fragrance that is acceptable to God realize where it began it began with the vessel being gold tested and tried through the fire then the second process the vessel had the fire of God inside of it and then thirdly God puts his prayer burdens inside that vessel so that then the vessel can pray effectively to God did you understand it are we tracking so the incense can only burn within a genuine fire from the altar of the Lord if you place incense into another vessel other than the golden vessel and also it must be in the hands of the rightful priest if you don't do this you die of being struck dead and there are no mistakes in this realm of operation so God required the priest to obey his instructions exactly the way he ordained them failure to do so the priest died failure to present the offerings or the sacrifices the right way meant God rejected the sacrifice the sacrifice was only acceptable if it was done in an orderly way tell somebody there's some realms where you have to take responsibility on your shoulders <laughs> that's why in ministry there's there's some realms of operation where God wants you to be faithful 
And sometimes it requires you to be faithful when nobody will. It still requires you to go there. You may go there and there is no one, but God is only required to see you going there. And the moment you get there, even if there's nobody, God just wanted you to make that move to test and see, are you somebody that I can tell? Go somewhere where it doesn't make sense and you will go and do it. So there's this realms where God requires you to operate rightly and make no mistakes. Otherwise, his glory will not execute what he wants to do. He will not be able to carry out the process or what he wanted to do if we don't do things in his order and in his plan. Now, your prayers, the sacrifices of your life, the sacrifice of prayer, your service to God or incense must be tried and tested in the fire of the Lord okay so whatever you're bringing to God God says you're still gonna to have to put it in my fire and see if I accept it whatever prayer you have you're gonna to have to put it into the fire of the Lord and see if the incense that rise from it or if the smoke that comes out of that incense is acceptable God is saying I want vessels of gold that have been tested and purified and the dross have been eliminated and I have my fire in you so that if I put a prayer inside of you and you pray, that prayer brings heaven down. The prophets of Baal are praying all day and nothing is happening. Then Elijah prays a very simple prayer and fire falls from heaven. That's a demonstration that Elijah was a golden vessel with a burden from the Lord, praying the rightful prayer, and God responded quickly with fire. God is saying, where well, every prayer that you offer, if I put it, your burdens, your prayers, your intercessions, if I put them on my flame, will they pass the test of producing a smoke that is acceptable to me? And he's not talking about earthly smokes. He's saying, is the fragrance from that prayer acceptable? Is it flowing out of a vessel that has died to self? Is it flowing out of a vessel that is yielded to the Holy Spirit? Is it flowing from a vessel that is connected to the Father? Is it flowing from a vessel that is praying from a spiritual place? Because that's the only prayer that God will receive. It must be tried and tested by the Lord and found acceptable or fragrant. Only the golden censer allow you to enter into him. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 20. It says, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 20 talks about now we can enter through the blood that was offered on the cross and through the veil which was his flesh that was torn. So the, the body of Jesus is actually the veil that was torn for us. But the golden censer will allow you to enter into an encounter with Jesus. The golden censer will allow you to access spiritual realms that many people will not be able to access. Jesus must allow you to go through fiery trials and wilderness experiences to perfect you into a golden vessel. Tell somebody fiery trials, wilderness experiences are used by God to perfect me. You know, a lot of people listen to that kind of a message and they go like, well, um, I thought Jesus went on the cross and finished all the work and I don't have to do all these things. And the answer to those kind of people is this. Is this why is Paul saying, walk your salvation with fear and trembling? Why is Paul saying, once I've preached to other people, I do not want to be disqualified. So I punish myself daily, you know, so that I, I don't get disqualified. He's talking about an ongoing work of purification. Tell somebody an ongoing work of sanctification. Just because the children of Israel had gone out of Egypt and got to the wilderness, it didn't mean that they're in the promised land. Tell somebody getting out of the Jordan and you know, crossing the Red Sea doesn't mean you're in the promised land. <laughs> they thought that they would just cross from Egypt, cross the Red Sea, then we are okay. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Now there's no trouble. But they realized that the wilderness required them to make choices the wilderness required them to show gratitude to god the wilderness required them to pray and seek god for answers the wilderness exposed them to a life that was dependent on god they did not even know how to pray for for a season of time they cried out to moses and told moses can you ask god to send us this because they couldn't pray for themselves god wanted them to learn how to do what how to seek him 
Moses became an idol. And that's why sometimes you don't want to become an idol to anybody. Tell somebody you don't want to become an idol to people. You can take the cow to the water and teach them how to drink, but you can't force them to drink. You can teach people how to pray, but they can't come to you all the time for prayers because then they're going to make you an idol. They're going to make you the Holy Spirit. They're going to make you Jesus. They're going to try to come to depend on you. The Israelites, God wanted them to learn how to depend on God. There's nothing wrong with seeking help from people, but Jesus wants us to go to him more. Tell somebody, go to him more. Because then the glory goes back to who? To, to him. But he, he, listen, he wants us to train people how to access these areas, how to pray, or how to pray effectively so that they can do it for themselves. Just crossing the Red Sea doesn't mean you're in the promised land. You're still going to have to depend on God every day for your daily supply. You're going to have to depend on the grace of God to provide lightings in the wilderness at night. Or to drive away animals. Realize that in the wilderness there's animals. So God used the light to drive away the animals and to give them warmth. But also to guide and direct them. He wanted his spirit to be their source of light. Source of guidance. Source of their warmth. And to protect them from the beast of the field. God also wanted them to depend on him for their daily bread. So just crossing the Red Sea was not the end of the road. And just because we got saved, it doesn't mean all the problems disappeared. But God wants us to now begin to depend on him and know how to intercede and seek his face for the things that we're asking for. So unless your life has been purged of every dross and impurity and yeast, you cannot be a golden censer. Only golden censers qualify to carry the fire from the altar of the Lord. It can only entrust his glory and it's fire with golden vessels. And we're going to see later on what really happens is that the people who are not golden vessels and try to encounter the presence of God died. The cloud of incense rising means that the vessel is golden and the priesthood is right. It is the pleasing aroma that rises to the Lord out of your life being acceptable to God. The cloud is your life when it's placed before the Lord, before his precious blood. Does it attract mercy or judgment? When you put your offering before the Lord, when you put your life before the mercy seat, does it attract judgment or mercy? But the only way it can attract mercy is through the blood of Jesus. Because he's the one who said, yes to mercy and no to judgment so that through him we are not judged away from him judgment condemnation inside of him we are safe from judgment and condemnation as long as we abide tell somebody abide stay remain it's talking about consistency tell somebody consistency the time that we are living in right now requires consistency. Tell somebody consistency is required in our time now. You can't be a Christian who's one week a good Christian, next week a bad one. No, that's gone. Those baby Christian days are, are over. To survive what is coming, we're going to have to be strong, okay? Resolute. We're going to have to be strengthened in the spirit, tried and tested and uh, fortified by God, able to face oppositions and overcome. If your life and service was placed before his blood, will it qualify for his mercy? Remember the mercy seat is God's covering of our sins. His mercy seat is Jesus through his blood. In Numbers chapter 16, judgments came upon those who did not walk in this order. Let us look at it. The priest is said to take the coals of the altar of the Lord, place them into the censer then carry the censer into the most holy place after it was within the veil he will take the incense that was in his hands and put it inside the censer this will create a cloud of incense that will cover the mercy seat and once this was accomplished then the priest will take the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and it, here's Leviticus 16 14 and he shall take the blood of the bullock sprinkle it 
with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger even seven times so the priest could not offer any service that pleased the lord until it was inside the veil tell somebody you can't offer any sacrifice to god that is pleasing to him if you don't offer it from behind the veil or the inner sanctuary or the secret place so god is telling us to pray from the secret place tell somebody pray from the secret place that means praying in your spirit tell somebody praying in the spirit is actually praying in the secret place praying in the spirit is praying beyond the veil you're within the veil then you could make your sacrifices to the lord while you're inside the veil no one was allowed inside the veil only qualified people so i believe that we are in a season where god is qualifying people and there's people who have grace and levels that others don't have it's not because god is playing some kind of favorites no god knows the ones who have made a decision to go a little bit farther than everybody else god knows the disciples that have gone up yonder and said well while well, others can stay over there i'm not satisfied with that i want to go farther so only the people that could go into the veil because they were qualified will offer sacrifices that also translates in our day to day that god's not it's not just going to give his glory to anybody god's going to find some people that are able to go behind the veil people that are able to intercede past the outer court and the elementary stuff and go deeper into god and those are the people that god will allow to make intercession from that right standing place or the right the righteous place you cannot enter into Christ's service without qualification. Okay? So basically what God is saying is you cannot enter into service without Him qualifying you. Theological schools can't qualify you. Seminaries cannot qualify you. Sturdy will not qualify you. You still need God to qualify you. Because if God qualifies you, then you have His stamp of approval upon your life it backs you heaven backs you so you better get qualified by god you can go to those schools if you want to but make sure god also qualifies you <laughs> because just like paul even after the qualification of being in a sanhedrin and being a pharisee and all his education god still put him in the wilderness for three years to qualify him jesus had to go for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness Moses had to spend <laughs> those 40 years in the wilderness. Tell somebody God has to qualify you. So how, how does, what was the qualification of entering into this service? Number one, being rightfully called into the priestly office. No fake offices and no fake callings and no fake salvations. There's a lot of people out there with fake salvations. They were, they were not authentic salvations. Why? Because somebody scared them with hell and they got saved. They did not get saved because Jesus, the darling of heaven, came down on earth and died for their sins. They didn't recognize themselves as sinners who deserved mercy from him. And the only thing that they got scared of is I don't want to burn in hell and they got saved. Make sure that your salvation is authentic. Make sure that your calling is sure. Make sure that there's no fake giftings in you. And then number two, going through the wilderness experiences, the fiery trials of God, being tested and tried. These are the qualifications of God. He calls you. He takes you through the wilderness experiences, the fiery trials. Everybody wants the anointing. They don't want to pay the price. Everybody wants God to move on them but they do not want to lay their life on the altar and die so god says i gotta call you rightly you gotta be authentically saved and then number two i'm gonna take you to the wilderness if you've been trained in a theological calling god says i'm gonna take that knowledge you have from there and i'm gonna wipe it out in a wilderness of training just like paul in arabia when paul came out of arabia there was no theological seminarian knowledge in his brain the holy spirit had washed it all away and gave him a spirit-filled message about Christ and him crucified. And he said that's all he would preach about. Christ and him crucified. He didn't mention all the hermeneuticals that he learned from the theology college. Number three. 
being baptized with fire. Tell somebody being baptized with fire. From the altar of the Lord. Being purified until you are as gold with no impurities. And this talks about the work of sanctification. The ongoing work of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. This also talks about consecration. Being dedicated to God. And then number four is being filled or being baptized or infused burdened by the lord or consumed by him you begin to sense the burdens of the lord god begins to move and and move you around and guide and direct you you begin to walk in the spirit where you're no longer just filled with the spirit or baptized with the holy spirit but god is directing and guiding and leading you you become consumed with him. You, you get burdens from his spirit about things that you ought to do. Everybody else in your generation may have no burdens, but you have burdens from the Lord daily about things that he wants you to intercede for. When the Lord is weeping, you weep with him. Then the priest was purified and refined by fire and came forth as gold. Then only could he enter into the service of the Lord and offer is service there so we can see this is a process it takes time his holy life and consecrated life was like a smoke of incense that went before the lord and spared his life if the smoke came from a perfected life then it was spared it will be accepted and only could he offer any sacrifice before the holy presence of god and not be killed are you a golden censor? That's the question I'm going to ask all of you watching on the YouTube and all of you here. Are you a golden censor? Are you a holy golden container? Are you rightly standing before Jehovah? Are you filled with his fire? Are your garments as fine as linen? Are you as gold tested by him? Let's look at Leviticus chapter 10 from verses 1 to 2. Now Nadab and Abihu. Or Nadab and Ab Abihu. Some people call him Abihu, and some people say Nadab and Abihu. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. These are sons of a pastor, the sons of a priest. They each took their censers and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offer, it says, an authorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them to do. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. So God killed pastor's kids because they thought that since we are pastor's kids, we have inherited from, from bishop. <laughs> so we can also just operate in the same. And God says, no, he killed them. They offered an authorized fire. Tell somebody an authorized Whatever that fire that they offered there was not acceptable. Now, there's a lot of arguments about this. Was it that they, they took um, a wrong type of sensor and put it in their vessels? Is it that um, they got into the temple while they were drunk and they could not follow the instruction correctly and they did something wrong and because of that God judged them and there's a lot of scriptures that could prove either point let's look at uh, what he says this is one one day the two sons of Aaron Nadab and Abihu came along and offered incense with a strange fire and the Hebrew word translated strange here means an authorized foreign or profane fire so God not only rejected their sacrifices, he found it so offensive that he burnt them all. So he, he, he took them plus their fire, he just kind of consumed them. The fire of God licked them off like a sacrifice on the altar. But he says that it was something strange. It was a strange offering. It was a strange lifestyle. They were standing before the Lord walking with the devil and trying to present the Lord. One food in the world, one food in the kingdom. They tried to present the Lord with a mixture in their life. An authorized fire, a foreign fire, a profane fire. And God says it's unacceptable to him. Now let's look at this. Moses explains to Aaron in Leviticus chapter 10 verses 3. He says this. Why God has judged them, this is what the Lord spoke. When he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy in the sight of all people and I will be honored this is what God told Moses immediately after judging them go tell Aaron that among those who approach me 
I will show myself as holy. So that means that if you're not walking in holiness and you approach a holy God, your sacrifices will be rejected. For them, it was death and destruction and their sacrifices being rejected in the process because they did not approach God as a holy God and they did not honor him because honor is also included. I will be honored. So there, there, there must have been no honor. All right. So what is an authorized fire? It also means that Nadab and Abihu were burning the incense with fire of their own making. Tell somebody fire of their own making. Whatever fire they were offering here was not the rightful fire. It was not the procedure. It was not the same ingredients that are required by God. But they offered a fire of their own making. Rather than taking fire from the altar of God, they had their own specification. Doesn't this remind you of Cain? When God had a specified offering that he wanted and Cain brought vegetables and God rejected it. He says, you didn't present the right thing and I rejected it. Rather than doing things the way God wants them to be done, sometimes we choose to do it our own way. We pick shortcuts. The Lord is taking too long. I don't want to wait. So I'm going to start this while I'm waiting on the Lord. If we don't do things exactly the way God is doing them, God's going to reject our sacrifices. Let's read Leviticus 16:12. And he shall take the censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and a handful of sweet incense, beaten small, and shall bring it inside the veil. God is saying, it shall take censer. What do we say censer is? It's a golden vessel, all right? God says, you'll bring me a vessel with coals of fire. Where is the fire coming from? The altar of the Lord. Bring me a vessel that is full of my fire. Let me translate it in our time today. He's saying this, bring me a believer, a son or daughter in Christ, all right, who I have tested and tried through the fires of life and they have overcome. Then my fire is inside of them, all right. Then now they are serving me with sweet hands, which means their service is precious to me, all right. Then put prayer inside of them. Then they will bring it before me because then I will receive that prayer. This is the only reason why Aaron and Moses could stop the plague because their lives were already fragrant. So they were doing everything rightly as the Lord commanded them to. Or it will have been that the two men came into the tabernacle drunk. Is it possible that they came into the tabernacle drunk? Uh, possibly because there's a scripture that talks about it. Let's read that scripture. Leviticus 10 from verses 8 to 9 he says and the Lord spoke to Aaron saying drink no wine or strong drink you or your sons with you when you go into the tent of meeting lest you die it shall be a statute forever throughout your generation so some people believe that they got in there drunk and because they were drunk they could not minister properly they were not sober minded and because of that they were caught up in their own ways and that that kind of interfered with their discernment and they offered a wrong fire and the Lord judged them for some people say that they tried to offer their own sacrifices with their own way and offered a profane fire a strange one because it wasn't accorded according to the requirements of God and therefore God judged them let's look at Acts and this is not just there Somebody will say, oh, but that's the Old Testament. God doesn't do that anymore. Oh, let's come to Acts chapter 5 from verses 1 to 11. Then a man named Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the money and brought only a part of it and laid it on the apostles' feet. And Peter said to Ananias, why have you done this? You could have kept some of the money for yourself. You made a vow to the Lord. And guess what God does? God judges them. They fall dead. Ananias falls dead and is buried. And his wife walks in there, falls dead, is buried. Because they had lied to the Holy Spirit. They were walking improperly. There was a procedure here. There was an agreement. There was a vow that they made before the Lord that they needed to fulfill. Failure to fulfill that vow meant judgment. All right. Let's look at Exodus chapter 19 and verses 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud and the people may hear when I speak with you believe thee 
forever. And Moses told the words to the people and to the Lord. Verses 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. These were requirements to approach the Lord. God is telling Moses, I'm going to come down on a mountain, but I want everybody to sanctify. Now, sanctification is what we've been talking about. It's moving out of the outer court things and moving past the, the holy place and getting sanctified so that you're getting closer to the Lord. Even then, they were required to clean their garments. What is garments here? Garment talks of your spirit and soul okay those are the spiritual garments of the lord is your soul and your spirit that must be kept blameless your flesh your, your your body your spirit and soul must be kept blameless at the appearing of the lord and god tells moses tell them i need them to sanctify themselves sanctify means to set yourself aside as holy so god says tell them to set themselves apart as holy today tomorrow and let them purify their souls and their spirits and then this is what he says verses 11 and be ready against the third day for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai and then in verses 12 he says this and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round and about saying take heed to yourself that you go not up into the mountain or touch the border of it whosoever touches the mountain will be put to death the same same thing God has standards and requirements. Tell the people there's boundaries. There's realms of authority. I don't require everybody to walk in those places. Anybody that is unqualified to handle those places dies. Tell somebody there's higher levels of authority. If you take on a level that God has not called you to walk in, you will be attacked by demons okay if somebody takes on a calling that god never gave them or begin to walk in levels where god never called them to walk in if you wake up in the morning and you give yourself a title apostle or you wake up in the morning and you start calling yourself a prophet or a pastor or a teacher satan is going to come after you because you're tampering with the levels god never called you to walk in therefore you have to be ready to pay the price of the level that you call god says tell them not to go on the mountain only moses is going to ascend this mountain listen he says or touch the border of it whosoever touches this mountain shall be put to death now let's look in uh, verses 13 there shall not an hand touch it but he shall surely be stoned or shot through whether it be a beast or a man it shall not leave when the trumpet sounded long you shall come up to the mountain who is coming up the mountain moses let's read this verses 21 and the lord said to moses go down again listen go down again charge the people lest they break through the lord to gaze and many of them perish he says go tell them that they should not even come to peek through this because they will die and verses 22 and then he says even to the pastors and the ministers too and let the priest also which come near to the lord sanctify themselves lest the lord breaks forth on them so god is saying it's not just the common people i'm requiring even the priest who are representing me to also walk in a way of sanctification lest i break out on them so this was a requirement it wasn't just the priest given this severe god was requiring his people to walk past these elementary things and to get to a place where the sacrifices that they were offering to god were acceptable where their services to god were acceptable let's look at verses 23 and moses said the people cannot come up to the mount sinai for thou charges us saying set bounds about the mountain and sanctified verses 24 and the lord said to him away get thee down and thou shalt come up though and Aaron with you even Aaron is only coming after he is being permitted realize Aaron is not going up there the first time Moses goes Aaron has to come when Moses now tells him yeah now you can come up with me he says now you can bring Aaron with you but let no other priest and the people break or come unto the Lord lest I break out on them 
Tell somebody, God, God has to call you. He has to test you and try you. Then he has to take his burdens and put them into your life. And then you can represent him well or you can pray effective prayers or carry your ministry well before him. There's a price to pay. There's a qualification. Tell somebody God has to qualify you. Aaron was called together with Moses. But God says, Moses, you go back and introduce Aaron, introduce Aaron your brother, now to this realm. Before that, Aaron could not go up there too. Other priests could not access that level. Tell somebody there's some levels that God will call you and there are lonely places that only you can go. There's some anointings that God will give you that will require you to not get married. That was a tough thing for Jeremiah, but that is calling could not have marriage. There's some men of God that I know that God will not even allow them to have children because of the ministry that they're going to have to do. They won't have time to be there for those children. So God will not permit them to have those children because there's no time. They have to crisscross the earth and preach everywhere and plant churches everywhere. And sometimes they're gone for two months. They can't be, they can't have a marriage because a marriage requires you to be there. You know? So there's some callings that will require you to walk alone. There's some levels that will require you to forsake other things that everybody is loving and embracing and God will call you out of those things and everybody will think you're crazy. There's some levels that God will tell you, step up here and it's only you. I don't want anybody else coming with you. Why? Because you have paid enough price to approach the throne of God. You have, you have allowed yourself to be tested and tried. You've allowed God to take you through the wilderness experiences that he needed to take you through. You've allowed God to take you through the fire and to purge your drawers. And God has done a beautiful work. And you're getting closer and closer to, closer to the veil. And you're about to enter into this place that once you enter into that veil, you never want to go back there. Not everybody takes that step. Not everybody moves past the outer court through the holy place into the holies of holies. And not many people stay there once they, once they get into that place. Many people still want to come out. But there was even a command when you're coming out. It says, when you're coming out, the cloth you're wearing, you must take it out and put on a new one. So when the priest left the holies of holies, the garments he was wearing... He could not take those garments with him outside. He had to take them off and put common clothes on before he can encounter people. Why? Because it, his clothes could kill people or consecrate them. What is that? God says that the, the spirit that you're ministering with before him, when he has separated you from everybody, when you go back to talk to common people, you can't speak in the same spirit with them. Or you can't operate in the same spirit that they are operating in. You have to take on a garment that will make them understand. You tell somebody a spirit of understanding. That's why sometimes when you, when, you, when you start speaking things, people don't understand or they think it's difficult. Like Paul's teachings were very hard. Why? Because Paul had been in places where he was not permitted to talk. And so when Paul spoke, people thought that his words were very difficult. Why? Because he had been in a place where when he came down to talk to no normal people, normal people couldn't understand what he was saying. Tell somebody, change your garment. <laughs> change your garment when you're talking to common people. He warned them that if they were not consecrated, if they violated their consecration, it would break out upon them. Nadab and Abihu violated the holy law of the priesthood when they did so god killed them reminding israel of the sanctity of his presence so that's why moses is reminding aaron this is what the lord has said among those who come near to me there must be sanctification tell somebody sanctification anyone who wants to carry the glory of god number one sanctify I can sanctify yourself. Allow the Holy Spirit through the word of God to sanctify you. Because God says, I will appear before my people holy. And everybody who appears before me must meet some standards. God is still a consuming fire. He is still a jealous God based on Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 24. So when we come into his presence, we are, not to come, we are, to, we are to come as children. Tell somebody we are to come as children innocent 
We have to come as children who have been reconciled. But there is to be godly fear inspired by respect for the one whom we are dealing with. We can't just approach God casually. We have to fear and honor him. In 2 Samuel chapter 6 from verses 1 to 7 and also 1 Chronicles chapter 13 from verses 9 to 12 the ark of God was being transported by oxen. I don't know who told David that God required a fancy limousine called a cart or an oxen to carry the glory of God. I don't know why they thought that it was supposed to be flamboyant and, f- and, <laughs> and <laughs> amazing transportation system to carry the glory of God. Listen to what God does here. They are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They're using oxen pulling the cart. The cart stumbles. This man called Uzer takes a hold of the Ark. God's anger burns against him, strikes him dead. And this was a son of a pastor too. The Ark of the Covenant had stayed in their house for some time. So they got used to the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, that's that box that stays in our house, right? <laughs> oh yeah, mom always preached the gospel. We all go, we all have gone to church. We know about the Bible. We know about the, the glory of God. Yes, familiarity. And there's a say that familiarity breeds contempt. All right. So here is the Ark of God staying in their house. Their father is a priest. They get used to the Ark of the Covenant. So when the Ark of the Covenant is falling, it thinks, I can help God because I'm familiar with him. And God says, there's no qualification. Dead. Now let's look at this. Numbers chapter 4 verses 15. And Aaron and his son had finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary as the camp sets out. And after the sons of the Kohathites shall come to carry these things listen to that the sons of Aaron finished the covering of the sanctuary all the furnishing of the sanctuary the camp sets out after the sons of the Kohath shall come and carry these things but they must not touch the holy things lest they die these are things of the tent which means God has designated other people to carry other mantles you can't just carry everything God has given you something. Stay on your lane and you'll be safe. Tell somebody, stay on your lane and you'll be safe. Even though the sons of Aaron had finished the covering and all those things, they had to wait for the sons of the Kohaths to carry some things. And then, they had not, even then, they could not touch anything because they would die because there was somebody else that was supposed to handle all that. Those are the deeper responsibilities belong to somebody else. Now let's look at David, David takes this man to collect the ark with him. So instead of allowing the rightful people to carry the ark, the Levites, to bring it to him, he gets a cart. He gets a wooden limousine. And he, put, he puts the ark on this cart. Whether old or new, the ark was not supposed to be carried on a, on, on a cart. It was to be carried upon men's shoulders. Shoulders talk of responsibility. God wanted to entrust his presence with responsible men and women. God wanted to give his glory to people who are responsible. Tell somebody, God will not give you his power if you're not responsible. That's why we don't have the glory of God in some of the generations. Because we lose on responsibility of handling the things of God. So David says, well, we're not going to go that traditional route. We're just going to get a cut and get some muscle guys, you know, to carry this ark and to pull it. The ark was not to be put upon the cart. It was to be carried on shoulders and carried by who? Levites only and of the family of the Kohathites. That's according to Exodus verses 20, chapter 25 verses 12 to 14. And also Numbers chapter 7 verses 9. And they were supposed to use poles as prescribed so that the poles go on their shoulders because even them they were so careful to not get close to touch the ark itself they had to handle with these poles on their shoulders realize what god is saying i have requirements i have expectations i have a plan i have an order i want to execute it exactly the way i have ordained it follow my instructions to every detail and you see me move 
disregard those instructions and judgment falls upon you or misfortunes fall upon you or your plan fails because God wasn't a part of ordering it. So the ark had stayed as Abinadab's house. Abinadab's house. Now Abinadab is the father of Uzzah. And the ark had stayed in their house according to 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 3. He had two sons. One of them is called Uzer, and the other one is called Ahio. Sounds like Ohio, isn't it? Uzer and Ahio. <laughs> and the ark had stayed in, in, Uzer, in, in uh, Uzer's family and Ahio's family. They got familiar to the presence of God. And Uzer, having been around the ark in his own home, thought that he could just help God because I know that thing. I know the glory of God. I can do that too. So there's times that we too, we fail to recognize the holiness of God. We become too familiar with Him and we develop irreverent attitudes towards the presence of God. And the judgment falls or God rejects our offerings. Uzzah for a moment felt it was his responsibility to save the integrity of God. Tell somebody you cannot help God. God is able to fight for himself. So he thought that, oh, well, God needs some help. So I'm going to go help him. And that the almighty God somehow needed his assistance. Here comes Uzer. I'm going to help God. <laughs> Nobody else is helping God. I'm going to help God. He wasn't qualified. <laughs> Dead. Translate that in our time today. It may not be physical death. But it may be afflictions and bad things happening because you disregarded the laws of God and his ordinance and his leading. Moses lost his right to enter the promised land because he felt his intervention was needed. Remember Moses too? What did he think? You think I can help God? God told him, speak to the rock, don't heed him. And Moses thought, well, I can do whatever I want. Smack the rock. And God says, nope. Disregarded my instruction struck the rock instead of speaking to it and God says you're not entering the promised land tell somebody instruction detail instruction hmm. so don't let excitement or emotion revoke instruction tell somebody don't let excitement or emotions revoke the instructions don't let casualness shroud your decree Let's repeat that again. Don't let excitement or emotions replace the instruction. Don't let casualness shroud the decree that God has given you. You got to go back to the decree. What did God say? How did God say it should be done? How did, what was the order that God says it should be carried? What was the system of carrying it? Follow it to the details because God says if you don't do it that way, it will be rejected. Let's go back to what it says here. It says the incense on the altar is a symbol of prayer. It says, let my people be counted as incense before thee. The lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice in Psalms 141 verses 2. Golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, according to Revelation chapter 5, verses 8. And it says, And the whole multitude of people praying outside at the hour of incense, and there was appeared unto them an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. That's Luke chapter 1, from verses 10 to 11. We see Jesus being associated with this incense rising up to God, or this cloud that's rising up to God so we can see that God is demanding what order tell somebody order following instruction offering sacrifices that have been tested or offering sacrifices from a vessel that has been tested and tried by fire and has come forth as gold and everything we present before him God's going to see if it qualifies because the vessel praying it is a right vessel. Say, if the vessel is right, the prayer will be accepted. 
if the vessel praying the prayer is walking not in the pattern of God, the prayer is rejected and there may be judgment. So what does this bring us to? A call for us to be vessels that are not just praying prayers. <music>